Hello, my name is Robert Campbell. I'm a Canada Research Chair in Bioanalytical Chemistry and, a, and an Assistant Professor in the Department of Chemistry at the University of Alberta. I'm pleased to have this opportunity to tell you a bit about my own work, as well as to give you an introduction to fluorescent proteins. Uh, specifically, my talk will focus on the engineering of fluorescent proteins with new and improved colors. So the two sort of take home messages I, I hope you'll get today are, are one, uh, why researchers such as myself bother engineering fluorescent proteins? What, what's, what's the point of doing it? Uh, and the second part is how we actually go about doing it. So I'm going to start with a bit of history on the discovery and characterization of uh, fluorescent proteins. So on your screen, uh, on the left of the screen, you can see a photograph of the Aquaria Victoria jellyfish. Uh, if you were to look very closely at the rim of the umbrella, you would see these sort of small nodules of green, that, these small nodules that glow green. Uh, it was in the early 1960s that a re researcher by the name of Osama Shimamura set out to discover why it was that these nodules glowed green, what chemically was, was going on inside of them. So in order to do this, uh, he had to harvest many thousands of jellyfish and carefully purify the proteins responsible for the, the green luminescence. Uh, he, he did this and he actually found two proteins. Uh, one was a quarin, that's an enzyme that generates blue light via a, a chemical reaction. The other protein was able to absorb the blue light and re-emit it as green light. This second protein was of course the, the green fluorescent protein or, or G, GFP as it's abbreviated. Uh, if you're interested in reading more about the, the, the early history or discovery or actually any any topic, any research results I, I mentioned in the course of this talk, all of the, the, the appropriate references are included at the end, and so you can uh, either skip ahead or, uh, or, or wait till then and, and copy, copy down the, those references. Uh, they're listed by, by topic. So now on the screen before you, you see a, a, a small tube that contains a solution a buffered solution of the green fluorescent protein. So this particular solution is being excited by uh, UV light, and so what your eye perceives is only the green fluorescence because you, you can't see uh, in the UV range of the, vis of the spectrum. So although uh, GFP was, the green fluorescent protein was first identified in the early 60s, uh, the re research into its properties and, and its real characterization I guess you could say it proceeded relatively slowly, because it wasn't until 1979 that Shimamura correctly proposed the structure of the chromophore, and it was 13 years later, in 1992, when it was reported that the gene encoding GFP had been cloned by, by Prasher. So cloning the gene, well, that, what that gets you is really a complete chemical understanding of, of the, the protein at least the, the precursor protein, um, because the, the, once you know the DNA sequence, you also know the protein sequence. So what's shown on this slide is the, the protein sequence in capital uh, letters using the single amino acid codes, and the DNA sequence using the standard uh, nucleotide abbreviations in, in lowercase. So we have the, comp so by 1992, uh, researchers had the complete DNA sequence and the complete amino acid sequence. Um, the part of the, the protein, of the green fluorescent protein, that's responsible for the green fluorescent color is actually these three residues right here, and I will elaborate on that in, in much more detail in the coming slides. So, yeah, that was 1992, and then it was two years after that in 1994 when the, came the first reports that you could take this DNA and put it into other organisms, such as bacteria or worms, and the DNA could still be, be read, you could say. It, could it can still be transcribed to produce RNA. The RNA can still be translated to produce protein, and that protein can still turn green fluorescent. It still, has, it still retains that properties. So that was reported by Ch Chelfi and, and Suji in 1994 in, in two separate reports. So this was really uh, an important step in, in the, the history of, of fluorescent protein development because this was the first time it had been shown that there was nothing jellyfish specific about the green fluorescence. So whatever this protein did to become green fluorescent, 
uh, it didn't need anything that was only found in a jellyfish, such as another protein, you might say, that maybe only the jellyfish has. It was self-sufficient uh, to form the green fluorophore. In 1996, so just two years, two years after that, uh, the, the three-dimensional atomic structure of GFP was reported uh, by, by two separate groups in individual reports once again. Uh, these, these structures revealed that GFP was this quite beautiful and unique protein uh, in terms of its overall fold. So it's basically a cylinder composed of 11 strands of, of, of beta sheet and this the, the, these strands of beta sheet uh, wrap upon themselves to in a overall in a circle, and that's what encloses the chromophore, which you can see in the middle. So the chromophore here that's that's the part that's actually green fluorescent, and it's composed from that the that that S Y G sequence I showed you on the previous slide: serine, tyrosine, glycine. It's you can see it's kind of like the heart of the protein. It's located right in the center, and it's protected by this beta sheet that surrounds it. This structure is quite distinctive and has been referred to as a, a beta cam. I'm going to use that metaphor uh, pretty extensively in this talk. I'm, when, for most of the talk, when I'm talking about GFP and its structure, I will just represent it as a, a, a colored can. And so you'll see a lot of that. So as an example, here we have GFP represented as a, a colored can. Uh, of course, it's green because it's green fluorescent. When I start talking about other colors, they'll be appropriately colored. I'm just going to take a step back now and try to give you a bit of a feeling about why GFP is such a revolutionary tool for use in live cell fluorescence imaging. So on the screen before you, you should see a, you see a very colorful mammalian cell. So here we have a single mammalian cell that's got lots of colors inside of it. The reason why this cell is so colorful is because it's been labeled with five different colors of fluorophore, each of which has been targeted to a different structure within the cell. So those five different colors and the five different structures to which they're targeted are represented on the bottom here. So I'm just on the next slide I'm going to go into a bit more detail about the actual strategy, the, the chemical basis of, of the labeling in each of these five for each of these five colors. Uh, the, the blue in this case is this is a, a DNA specific stain. So this cell has been treated with a small molecule which is a fluorophore and it can bind directly to DNA. And in, in that way the DNA has become uh, blue fluorescently labeled. I'm just going to skip this one for a second. Uh, the Golgi of this cell is yellow fluorescent by virtue of the fact that this cell has been treated with an antibody that is targeted against a Golgi specific protein and this antibody is coupled to a yellow fluorescent quantum dot. Skip this one and just go over here for a second. The, the mitochondria, uh, similar to the Golgi, the mitochondria has been labeled by virtue of the fact that the cell is treated with an antibody targeted against a mitochondria-specific protein, and that antibody is directly coupled to a small molecule dye known as Psi5. Now, in the case of the green and the red, uh, things are a little bit different. These are both approaches, both of these approaches are based on the fact that the cell is expressing a modified protein. So that means DNA has been introduced in the, into the cell such that it is, it is expressing a modified protein that allows this fluorescent labeling to occur. In the case of the tubulin, uh, GFP, uh, the cell has been transfected with some DNA that encodes a fusion between GFP and tubulin, and it, in that way, the GFP becomes associated with the tubulin structure, and that's what you see in the fluorescence microscope. In the case of uh, the red staining, the cell has been transfected with a, a modified version of actin which contains a, an extra peptide sequence fused to it and this dye known as REASH can bind specifically to that peptide sequence. Of course the, the focus of today's talk is, 
is not on all of these technologies. It's only really in regards to the, the green fluorescent protein. But I wanted to kind of present this as an overview of different ways of doing it. And it also allows me to really emphasize the, the big advantage of, of techniques such as GFP or REASH based labeling, labeling relative to antibody based labeling. And that is, is that these techniques have to be done in live cells. So the cell is actually making the fluorophore, so the cell can be li a, a living cell and the, the proteins can be behaving dynamically inside of the cell. In contrast, uh, antibody labeling, which is uh, by all means extremely useful, um, it's only really amenable to use in dead cells. And the reason is, is if you want to get the antibody inside the cell, you have to kill it and poke holes in the membrane so that the antibody can go inside and, and label its, its intracellular target. The GFP-based labeling has to be done with living cells. So the GFP, that's the focus of the talk today. And I'm just going to go and just elaborate on what I said uh, a little bit more about how these, this fluorescent labeling is actually done in practice. So the, the, basically the, the, the central dogma of, bi of biology is that uh, you go from D the flow of information um, is from DNA to RNA to protein. So DNA being copied to make RNA is a process called transcription. RNA is then tr uh, turned into protein in a process called translation, which uh, where the, the ribosome is the translator. Um, so if we were to make a, a fusion between the gene encoding the green fluorescent protein and the gene encoding actin, we've made a new chimeric protein, uh, which, is com which is sort of subdomains composed of both, both of these two proteins. Uh, this gene would be transcribed to make RNA, which once again in in has the information of this chimeric protein that has GFP fused to actin, and then finally, uh, this would be translated to make the, the protein product where we have the two proteins covalently connected by a, a polypeptide linker. So in, in a living cell, which I've represented here, uh, the same process will occur. So, But the first trick is to, of course, get the DNA inside of the cell. And that's very actually pretty straightforward using uh, for, for certain cell lines using uh, the technique of transfection. So it's not so hard to get the DNA inside of the cell. And of course the DNA will be transcribed to make the RNA. RNA will make protein. And now this protein, because the cell is living, this protein will function as, hopefully it will function as the, the, the protein of interest, in this case actin, normally would inside the cell. And the GFP is just kind of along for the ride. It's just to it, it doesn't. It, the idea is that it doesn't affect the, the 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 protein of interest function, but it does let it us uh, see us see the structure, the resulting structure inside the microscope. So in this case, actin uh, polymerizes to make uh, filaments, and the GFP does not interfere with formation of these filaments, but it does let it uh, see it in the microscope. So the cell might look something like this, in inside of the, when we take a picture using a fluorescence microscope where of course the, these these white lines represent the fluorescence due to GFP fused to actin. And I just for the just to really drive it home I just have to <laughs> make it very clear that GFP the, the ability to do this the ability to uh, put these this genetically encoded fluorophore into live cells has truly uh, been a revolutionary technology for, for live cell fluorescence imaging. Uh, this is a sort of a, a typical microscope you might use for fluorescence imaging. And as I've already explained in some detail, uh, you, you can look at cells in which the, the, the subcellular structures are fluorescently labeled, but it's a live cell. It, you can watch it move. Um, you can watch the proteins move inside the cell. You can watch the cell move. Uh, you can stimulate the cell and see how the proteins respond inside. So um, very powerful technology for that purpose, but even more so, even um, perhaps even more impressive, you can take, you can do this sort of thing in a whole animal. So there's now examples of uh, flies, worms, mice, um, ma many small organisms, even small mammals can be made transgenic so that they have the, these GFP, uh, GFP fusion proteins being expressed in every cell of your body, uh, as this mouse uh, here is. And this really opens up all new sorts of doors in studying uh, 
protein dy dynamics, cellular function in living organisms. Uh, and once again, I don't have time to cover any sorts of details of why you might want to do that, but uh, there's very many good reasons. And already that sort of research, research has provided a lot of insight into uh, biological function that would otherwise just be completely inaccessible to, to researchers. So the, the, these sorts of uh, approaches, these technologies have been made, of course, were made possible by the jellyfish. We have to thank the jellyfish first and foremost. But also, uh, researchers, specifically protein engineers, have had a pretty uh, important role to play in the development of this technology. And here's uh, an example, and I'll, I'll explain more about this later, but you can see here we actually have tubes of engineered fluorescent proteins that have different colors. So it's, it's and you can see wh where this starts becoming important because now instead of just labeling one protein inside of the cell with say a green label, we can start to label one green, one blue, maybe another one yellow, and we can watch multiple proteins uh, inside of a living cell. We can watch them interact. We can see if they go to the same places of the cell. Um, and in this way, we can get even more sophisticated information about uh, the biochemical roles of, of these proteins. Okay, so as I've already uh, mentioned, the, 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 the X-ray crystal structure of GFP was solved in, in 1996 by, by two groups, and a representation of that is shown here as a well, this is called a, a cartoon representation. So the, the coil that represents the, the, this protein is actually representing the, the backbone of the protein. So this is the, the, the linear chain of amino acids, but each amino acid has a side chain, and that what's ma that's what makes a methionine different from a serine, different from a lysine, is actually the side chain. And the side chains are not being shown in this representation. But if we were to uh, show the side chains, the, the protein does look quite a bit more um, maybe intimidating, more, more, more complex. There's obviously a lot of things going on here. Uh, but you can still see in the middle of the protein uh, the, the chromophore, which I've previously pointed out. And shown over here are the three amino acids that are modified to give rise to the chromophore of the, the green fluorescent protein. These, these residues are a serine, a tyrosine, and a glycine. So what actually happens to this serine, tyrosine, and glycine, which are, of course, uh, they're part of the polypeptide sequence of the green fluorescent protein, um, they, they actually undergo a series of what we'd say is post-translational modifications that are, that are catalyzed or otherwise promoted by the, the surrounding protein environment. And so shown on this slide are those three steps of post-translational modification. So here we have serine, tyrosine, glycine, as I pointed out in the, the sequence. And the first thing that happens is this, the nitrogen here of, of glycine 67 attacks this carbonyl carbon to make a, a five-membered uh, ring, a, a cyclic intermediate. A molecule of water is then lost from this intermediate. So we, we lose water uh, to make a double bond right here. And then in the third and, and final step, an oxidation of this carbon-carbon bond from a single bond to a double bond occurs, and that's what gives us the conjugated system of the green fluorescent protein, and that's the, the, the structure that actually is responsible for the color and the fluorescence. Okay, so if we just want to represent, go back to my can representation, and, and now we can rip open the can and show you the, the chromophore that's inside, and that's right here. So I've cut open the can to show you the chromophore. Uh, that's what actually gives rise to the, the, the green fluorescent properties of it. And I just, for the sake of the next few slides, I have to point out that, and recall that this part of the chromophore, this phenol moiety, it was derived from a tyrosine. So this part of the chromophore comes from this part of the, the amino acid tyrosine. Okay, I have to introduce a, a new concept here. That's the idea of site-directed mutagenesis, uh, a very uh, powerful technique. And, and basically what it means is using modern molecular biology techniques, we can take any 
one or, or more amino acid in this protein and change it to any other amino acid. And that's actually pretty easy to do. So for example, you could just pick one arbitrarily, pick this arginine. We could mutate it to any other one of these letters. So arginine has a positively charged side chain. If we were to mutate it to a, a, a glutamate, which is an E, which would be quite easy to do, we would be replacing that positively, char positively charged side chain with a negatively charged side chain, and that may change the properties of the protein. So now what, where it gets interesting is, well, what if we start changing the amino acids that are actually make up this chromophore? So remember, we have a, a serine, a tyrosine, and a glycine. Maybe we can change these amino acids and change the properties of the chromophore. And this is exactly what had occurred to uh, researchers very early uh, after the, the, the cloning and first expression of GFP. Uh, maybe if by changing these, these residues, we can start to make new colors. So the first one that was uh, published was where they, the, the tyrosine of the chromophore was mutated to a histidine. So here, once again, we have our, the wild-type protein with its chromophore derived from uh, tyrosine. And here's the, the, the phenyl moiety that comes from the side chain of tyrosine. If we mutate that to a histidine, so here's histidine. And the difference between histidine and tyrosine, of course, is not the backbone. This is the main chain. It's, it's got to do with the side chain of the, the amino acid. So this is also an aromatic side chain. Um, but it has a distinctly different structure than the phenol of, of, of tyrosine. And thus, we end up with a chromophore, which has a distinctly different structure. And because it has a different structure, you'd expect it to have different properties. It should absorb and fluoresce at different colors, and indeed it does. So this protein with the, the histidine-derived chromophore is actually known as blue fluorescent protein. Uh, it absorbs light around uh, in, in, deep in the blue region of the spectrum, like around 400 nanometers and uh, fluoresces around 450 nanometers approximately. So that was the first additional color of, of green fluorescent protein that was known. You can actually go on and try the other. There's, there's just actually a few other uh, aromatic amino acids. There's also uh, tryptophan. So once again, it has a, a different side chain, but still a, a, a conjugated system. And inserting... Uh, the, the tryptophan instead of the, the, the tyrosine and the chromophore gives you a different chromophore structure once again that has different properties and this one is actually known as cyan fluorescent protein uh, and so it fluoresces in the, the cyan region of the, the visible spectrum. The, 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 the only other uh, aromatic amino acid that, that you could use for this sort of purpose is phenylalanine shown here so it's a lot like tyrosine it's just missing the the phenol, the, the OH group right here, and putting it in does indeed make a new color of fluorescent protein, uh, but because it absorbs light um, well into the, the UV, actually, and fluoresces um, just outside of the UV, it was never really considered useful enough uh, to be used uh, in, in practical uh, terms in, in live cell imaging, so it, it's only really known as GFP tyrosine 66 phenylalanine, never quite deserved to get a name. Uh, but it does uh, demonstrate that the, 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 this protein is, is quite robust in its ability to accept different chromophore structures and still do those post-translational steps necessary to form uh, th this chromophore structure. Okay, so everything I just told you about focused on mutating the tyrosine to, of that actually ended up in the chromophore to, to different residues. But, per, but of course, there, there's still many, many other um, amino acids in, in this protein. There's 238 in all. We've always focused on one of them. Well, what happens if we start mutating any of these other 238 amino acids? Well, of course, for in some cases, it's going to have no effect. So, for example, say we picked uh, this, this arginine right up at the top of the protein here. Say we pick that one and we mutate it say from a, an arginine to a lysine or arginine to a glutamate, is that really, do we expect that to have any effect on the, the, the fluorescent properties? Well, no, we don't, because it's far, far away from the chromophore. It's pointing out into solution. It's difficult to see how that could have a, a real effect on the, on, the, on the properties of the chromophore and, or, and change its, its color. However, if we do pick a residue that's much closer to the chromophore, and let's look at some of these that are very close. Um, so 
let's see. This one right here. So here's a residue that's very, very close to the chromophore. This is actually a threonine, and because I've spent so much time looking at this protein, I know that this is threonine 203, and you can see just how it is positioned um, very, very close to, to, the, to the green space-filling part that represents the green fluorescent protein. And in the, in the primary sequence, threonine 203 is right down here. So this is very, very close, and back in the, in the, in the mid-1990s, researchers realized that perhaps by mutating this residue, which is so close to the chromophore, they could change the properties of the chromophore, change, change its color. So the mutation that they actually made was threonine 203 to tyrosine, and that's represented here. Uh, here we have, th this is the, the 203 position, and now it's a, a tyrosine, that's, and it's very close to chromophore. It turns out in this mutant, uh, this, this tyrosine ring at, at, at two, position 203 uh, forms a pi stacking interaction with the phenol portion of the chromophore. So this is a, essentially what we can say is making a stabilizing interaction. So stabilizing means that it's lowering, it's pro, it must be lowering the energy of the excited state, which in turn gives rise to a redshift in the fluorescence. And if we start at green and we, we move a little bit towards the red spectrum, we end up at yellow. And thus this redshifted protein is known as yellow fluorescent protein. Another sort of classic example of uh, a big change in the, in the fluorescent properties of, of the green fluorescent protein without changing its chemical structure is the variant known as enhanced GFP or EGFP. And in this case, uh, the serine 65 threonine mutation was found to greatly change the, not the, the, the fluorescence color, but actually the, the excitation wavelength of the, of the protein. Um, and it, it did it by changing the protonation state of the, this phenyl group in, in, the, in the ground state before it gets excited. And this was very useful just because the, the, the new excitation wavelength matches up very well with um, common lasers uh, that are, with lasers that are very common and, and widely available. Okay, so what I've just told you is, in a nutshell, w where this sort of original set of colors came from, how, how they were engineered. So remember the, the blue cyan, the blue and cyan versions were, were made by changing the covalent chemical structure of the chromophore. Uh, YFP was made by changing the, the environment of the chromophore, putting in a, a tyrosine and a pi stacking interaction. EGFP was made by changing the ionization state of the chromophore. And the difference between wild type GFP and EGFP is not in their fluorescence color. They both fluoresce green, but they just have different excitation wavelengths. Uh, wild type GFP excites best um, right in the, in the blue region of the visible spectrum, whereas EGFP excites best with cyan colored light. So, I mean, this was great. I mean, th this, I've already told you about many years of, of work um, and the efforts of many researchers just to get to this point. So, and all of these colors are very useful, but I, I guess the question remains, um, can we make them even better? Better can mean many, many different things when it comes to these fluorescent proteins. It, uh, on, on the simplest sense, it could just mean, could the, their fluorescence be brighter? Could, could they more efficiently absorb light and then uh, re-emit that light? Uh, photostability is also a major concern. So it turns out that all chromophores, be they fluorescent proteins or small molecules, destroy themselves at some rate when you shine light on them. And that's called their photostability, uh, how long they last when they're, while they're being illuminated. And so more photostability is better. Um, another one is actually just their folding efficiency. How well do these, if, if you just make the, this polypeptide chain inside of a cell, how well does it fold up into the, the three-dimensional structure and how efficiently does it generate the chromophore inside of it? So th there's many different concerns that, that people might have with respect to these proteins. And can we actually make them better than they were? Can we take this original set and improve them in these properties? Well, th of course, the answer is uh, yes, we can. And there's, there's basically two ways of doing this. One is the uh, irrational approach, where you, you just randomly mutate the gene encoding the protein, make a, a library of variants, and then you screen it to find an improved variant. Uh, the, the, the second approach is more rational, and in certain cases, when you, when you know what it is you want to improve, 
and uh, you think you know how you might be able to do it, you could just use site-directed mutagenesis to insert a specific change that might make the protein better. So there's sort of an irrational and a rational approach to engineering. I'm just going to uh, demonstrate or at least uh, guide you through the, both of those approaches briefly here. So here's the, uh, what you see on the screen now before you is, I guess, the irrational approach. So we have a, a, a gene encoding the fluorescent protein of, of interest. We, we use polymerase chain reaction to make many copies of this gene, but we do it under conditions where the mistakes are made. So in the course of this gene being amplified, just on occasion and randomly, there will be certain genes that end up with a mistake inside them. So a mistake means that um, one nucleo the, the wrong nucleotide has been incorporated. So if we make a change at the DNA level, that, could, that will also mean that the protein will be changed because we've changed the DNA. So we've also changed the protein sequence. So by doing this, we can make a gene library. We can insert this into E. coli uh, through the process of transforming E. coli. And then we can plate these E. coli out on, a, on media on which they like to grow. And then each individual E. coli grows up into what we call a colony, which is a, a group of genetically identical variants that all are derived from just a single bacteria. And so here we have many hundreds of colonies. And we're looking at this um, particular plate under UV uh, illumination. So you, you can see some, you see the fluorescence of the colonies here. We can then look at this uh, plate through, through goggles, which uh, filter out the excitation light and allow us to see the, the brightness of the, of the colonies. And in doing this, we, can, we might be able to see one that is brighter than the others. And hopefully the reason why it's brighter is because it has acquired a mutation that, has make, that just makes it brighter for whatever reason. Uh, so if we see one that's brighter, for maybe that one was brighter right there, we can pick it. And by pick, I mean we literally uh, use a, a tip uh, of a, a small plastic tip or a, even a toothpick to, to touch the colony and then transform it, uh, transfer it into fresh uh, media, liquid media, where it will grow up, uh, make many more copies of itself. We can purify and characterize the protein to make sure that it is, it is indeed improved relative to the starting material. And we can also purify the DNA and repeat this process. So by repeating this process many, many times, we can take a protein that's not very bright and engineer it, or we might say use laboratory evolution to make it brighter. So I've prepared a, a, a little movie that will demonstrate in practice uh, what I just described sort of uh, in theory on, on that slide. So here we have a, a plate of bacteria colonies, much like we saw in the previous slide. Here we have some goggles that we'll be putting on to filter out the excitation light. And here's a, a tube of, of media that we're going to put a, a bacteria, a, a colony into and allow it to grow up. So it's going to run the movie now. So there we see all the colony, colonies on the bacteria, um, sorry, colonies on the plate. Maybe several hundred colonies there. Take the goggles. Now I'm going to zoom in, get a better look, turning off the lights and turning on uh, some blue light to illuminate these. So these are these particular uh, bacteria are excited best by blue light. And now we've just put on the yellow go goggles. And so the yellow goggles filter out the excitation, but allow the fluorescence emission, the, that green emission to pass through. And there I'm picking that colony in the, in the right, right, right from there. Okay. So I've just picked it onto a tip. Now I'm putting, moving the tip over to about here. You know, turn the lights back on. You can still see some of the fluorescence there. We're still wearing the goggles. Uh, so zoom out, take off the goggles. And now you can see how the goggles are filtering out the blue light. Take that tip, which remember that has the, the fluorescent, that brightly fluorescent colony on the end of it. And we can put it into some fresh media. Well, we'll let that grow overnight, and in come morning, uh, it'll be cloudy with with those genetically identical bacteria, and we can either characterize the protein that the bacteria are making, or we can purify the DNA and repeat the process. We can do the the air prone PCR again and plate them out 
once again, pick the brightest one. And then that way we sort of bootstrap our way to a brightly fluorescent, fluorescent protein. What I showed you was the irrational approach. What I'm going to show you now is an example of the, the rational approach for engineering of fluorescent proteins. So one problem with GFP is that it is a, a weak dimer. And so what that means is if you have a solution of the green fluorescent protein that's very low, say like 10 micromolar or 0.01 millimolar, uh, the protein will be monomeric, which means it does not want to stick to itself. It's quite happy just to exist um, sort of free floating as an individual unit. If we increase the, pro the, the concentration of protein up to a, about 0 0.1 millimolar, uh, which is, turns out to be about the KD for this interaction, the protein will start to stick to itself and make dimers in solution. At this concentration, it'll be a mixture, at a 0.1 millimolar concentration, it'll be a mixture of dimers and monomers. And then if we go to even much higher concentrations, uh, it will all exist in dimers. And for, and for some purposes, for some uh, types of live cell experiments you might want to do with GFP, this, this presents uh, a real problem. But the, the scope of that is, be, be, the, that further discussion of that is beyond the scope of this talk, but let's just say it, it, it's, it's a problem for, for GFP. So uh, a researcher in the lab of Roger Chen uh, by the name of uh, David Zacharias took it upon himself to fix this problem. And what he did is he took a, a careful look at a, a one particular crystal structure of GFP in which the protein is actually in its dimeric form in the crystal structure. And he found a, a residue in the interface of this dimer that's called alanine 206. And it, it's, it's apparent from the structure that when the protein dimerizes, alanine 206 on the two monomers that make up the dimer end up very close to each other. So he had the idea that by mutating it to a, a larger residue, he may be able to disrupt this interaction. And so this is indeed what he did. He mutated alanine 206 to lysine. So whereas alanine is a small um, non-polar residue, lysine is a large residue that carries a positive charge. And so you can imagine you've got these on, on both proteins. And for these proteins to come together into their dimer, you would have to force these two residues, the, these lysine residues from both monomers very close together. But of course, the positive charges will repel. And also there will be uh, the size issue. And so this, by putting in this mutation, it, you effectively abolish the ability of the GFP to dimerize. And so this is an ex another example of making it better. But in this case, it was rational, uh, a rational approach in, as opposed to an irrational approach that was successful. OK, so using these both irrational and rational approaches to improving fluorescent proteins, that original set of colors I guess now has descendants which are improved relative to the original set. So for each of these different colors, there's now a, a selection. And I've, I have, this is not exhaustive. This is just some of the highlights. It, there, there's now a wide selection of descendants of this original set that are improved by any one of a, a number of criteria. Um, we can't, no, no one protein is perfect. No one of these fluorescent proteins is perfect. Uh, but some are, are better for certain things than others. And that, that's actually why it's important uh, if you're designing an experiment that's going to use fluorescent proteins, you do have to still think about which particular variant might be best for your application. Okay, so everything I've talked about to, so far has been variants of fluorescent proteins derived from the original jellyfish fluorescent protein. So basically only one fluorescent protein gave rise to all of this diversity of colors that I showed you on the previous slide. In 1999, uh, a publication appeared that really changed everything in terms of the, the world of uh, fluorescent protein engineers. Uh, a, a group from Russia led by uh, a researcher by the name of Luke, Lukianov reported that coral uh, is a, you, an abundant source of fluorescent proteins. Many of the, the corals that are present on coral reefs and build coral reefs uh, have fluorescent proteins in them that are similar to GFPs, have similar structures to GFP. And what was really amazing is that they're not just green. They, they come in a, a variety of different colors. 
including cyan and yellow, so cyan, green, yellow. And of course, these are colors that this wasn't so exciting because these colors had been successfully engineered from the Aquaria jellyfish. Even though the, it was green, we, researchers in the lab had made these sorts of colors. But what was really mind-blowing is that the coral had done what protein engineers could not, and that was make orange, red, and even far red uh, variants of, of, of these proteins. That, that, so they're, they're similar to GFP, but yet they have these really dramatically different colors. And, and that was uh, really opened up a whole bunch of uh, new opportunities. So there was one protein of particular interest uh, that was mentioned in the original publication, and that was the discosoma uh, red fluorescent protein. So discosoma is the name of the coral, and of course RFP stands for uh, red fluorescent protein. You might notice that I'm doing something a little bit different here with respect to the way I'm representing the fluorescent proteins. Instead of just a single can to represent each color, I used four cans. And the reason I did that is because uh, it, it seems as though all of these coral fluorescent proteins are obligate tetramers. And so that means that four copies of the, the protein must come together in order for the, the protein to properly form its chromophore. Shown on this slide is the X-ray crystal structure of the discosoma red fluorescent protein, uh, which was determined by, by two groups independently, one, uh, and one was published in 2000 and another in 2001. Uh, what I want to point out about this structure is that the, the protein is, consists of four copies of a protein that looks very much like the, the green fluorescent protein. So it has each monomer of the tetramer has the, the distinctive beta can structure of, of GFP, similar to GFP. And the chromophore in each monomer is located at the same place. It's, the chromophore is right in the middle of the protein right there uh, in the same place as the, the green chromophore is present in the green fluorescent protein. And so this overall structural similarity of the monomers as well as the similar positioning of, of the chromophore would, might suggest to you that the chromophore will have a similar structure to that present in GFP, but yet it's red, not green. So, so what's, what's the difference? So here I show once again that, that can representation and the, we've ripped open the can to, to see what the structure of the chromophore is inside. Uh, and you'll see, first of all, you should notice that, some, that this part is identical, practically identical to the structure of the, the chromophore of the green fluorescent protein. But the difference is that there's this extra bit of conjugation here. So there's this extra uh, acylimine moiety which extends the conjugation of the chromophore. And this is what's responsible for the redshift and the reason why this is a red fluorescent protein as opposed to a green fluorescent protein. So how does this form? So once again, the, 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 the structure of the beta can is the same, the chromophore is the same. So once again, we might expect the mechanism of the chromophore formation to be the, the same. And uh, evidence seems to suggest that it is. So we start with three amino acids, just as we did with GFP, uh, but in this case, it's actually a glutamine here um, instead of a serine as it was in wild type GFP, but the tyrosine and the glycine, that's exactly the same. So we still get the, this, this nitrogen acting as a nucleophile attacking this carbonyl to make a, a five-membered uh, intermediate, five-membered ring intermediate, um, then losing a, a molecule of water right here to make a double bond, oxidation of this carbon-carbon single bond to a double bond uh, to make uh, a green, actually it turns out you can see this um, in, in the, while, while the protein is maturing, while this is happening, you can see development of a, a green uh, absorbing or fluorescing intermediate. Um, but then something else happens to make it red and that's this, another oxidation of this bond right here to make the final uh, red fluorescent chromophore of the, the red fluorescent protein. Okay, so I've already talked, I've already mentioned that dimers were, were problematic. The fact that GFP were, is a dimer was problematic and that was a, some, a problem that needed to be fixed. Um, tetramers, even worse. So I, I hope to explain that a little bit more uh, on this slide. So if we, if we compare uh, GFP at low concentration or a monomeric GFP to RFP, let's see what happens. So here we have, once again, this actin-GFP fusion. This is the, the DNA. 
and we'll say this is a mono, one of these monomeric variants of GFP, so it doesn't dimerize, it just stays as a monomer, or it could be the, just the wild type, type GFP at uh, low concentration. So inside of this, when this is ex, uh, protein is formed inside of the cell, uh, it incorporates into the actin filaments, and so we end up with our green fluorescent protein associated with the, the filaments inside the cell, and we can see that in the microscope. Now, you could imagine trying to do the same thing with the, the red fluorescent protein fused to actin, and now, of course, because the red fluorescent protein becomes a tetramer, the actin that is fused to it has also, in effect, become a tetramer. And now when this is inside of the cell, what this, this unnatural uh, red fluorescent protein actin fusion will do is or could do is act as a cross-link between different actin fibers. And overall, this will have a, a, a very dramatic and, and negative effect on actin function. And so when you look for the red fluorescence inside of this cell, you, you don't see uh, nice properly formed actin filaments as you do with, with the GFP. What you see is um, protein aggregates or uh, precipitated protein that just shows it's not functioning properly. So the, the, the conclusion here is that we need to do something about this tetrameric structure, uh, and we need to take these tetramers and turn them into monomers. Okay, so this really now gets into my own uh, research career. So in the year 2000, I had just finished my PhD, and I was starting a, a postdoctoral fellowship in the lab of Roger Chen, at the University of California in San Diego. And at the time I got there, uh, a graduate student in the lab, uh, Jeffrey Baird, had been working with the red fluorescent protein and trying to tackle this, this very problem. He had found that if you introduce the isoleucine 125 arginine mutation into this protein-protein interface, so here we have isoleucine 125 shown in green. So isoleucine is a, a, a smaller uh, hydrophobic residue so if you mutate an isoleucine to an arginine, you're replacing something smaller and hydrophobic with something bigger, and that carries a positive charge. So just as the, the alanine 206 lysine mutant in GFP disrupted the, the dimerization, so too does the isoleucine 125 arginine mutation in the RFP. So putting in that mutation breaks the tetramer into a dimer. And that was uh, that was where this project was at at the time when Jeff uh, Baird left the lab and I took over with the, the engineering of the red fluorescent protein. So what I found is I could take that, that mutant, that dimeric mutant, and start to do directed evolution on it, so randomly mutating it, screening libraries to make it more brightly fluorescent. Um, I, in doing that, I actually made a very brightly fluorescent dimer which I then set out to break apart the remaining interface. And this proved to actually be quite challenging because most mutations that broke apart the interface resulted in monomeric proteins that had no fluorescence whatsoever. Uh, so it had just been too disruptive. But eventually I found uh, a pair of mutations um, at histidine 162 and alanine 164 that I could introduce and break apart the, the protein and retain uh, a tiny amount of red fluorescence. And when I say tiny, I, I really mean uh, not much red fluorescence at all, and in fact, it was very difficult to um, tell the red fluorescence of these of the first generation monomer from just the autofluorescence of E. coli alone. So, just E. coli with no fluorescent proteins are about as fluorescent as E. coli with this this first generation monomer. So that's so starting from that, that first generation monomer that, that was very weakly fluorescent, I did a, a very extensive uh, process of directed evolution, so doing many, many cycles of, of mutating the protein, uh, finding the best variant, and eventually ended up with a protein named as MRFP1, or monomeric red fluorescent protein 1, which actually has a total of 33 mutations uh, relative to the, the discosoma, the tetrameric discosoma red fluorescent protein. This, this work was published in 2002, and MRFP has proven to be a, a very useful to, tool for use in live cell imaging, but it was by no means perfect. Um, it was still uh, didn't behave properly in some fusions, and it was still not nearly as bright as we might have liked it to be. So during my uh, 
remaining time in the Chen Lab, I, I set about trying to make MRFP1 better, so make it more brightly fluorescent and make it behave better in infusion proteins. And then I was joined in my research by uh, Nathan Shainer, a graduate student in the, the lab of Roger Chen at the time. And together we, we set about making a, a wide range of, of new colors derived from MRFP1, as, and, as well as trying to make MRFP1 uh, better and the sort of the, the direct descendant of MRFP1 that retains similar spectral properties is known as M cherry. But we also made these other variants, which were uh, both blue shifted, most of which were blue shifted uh, relative to M cherry. And then another uh, researcher in the lab, uh, Lei Wang, actually made some uh, red shifted, some variants that were further red shifted from uh, M cherry, and they're known as M plum and M raspberry. So you can imagine um, with, with all of these different variants, it, naming them, keeping track of the names uh, did become quite problematic. And it was uh, the idea of, of Roger Chen to you, use the name of fruits. And I, I think this has been a very uh, good decision because, of course, we are all familiar with fruits and we, the, the, we are all familiar with the color of fruits. So the name actually does give you a little bit of information about the color of the, of the fluorescence. So with regards to the color of fluorescence, I, I, I'm using a representation here that I haven't shown yet. Um, what, what you, this bar you see on the, the slide in front of you is, represents the visible spectrum of light. So the, these colors more or less represent the color you, you would perceive if, if, if you were actually looking at light uh, of this particular wavelength. Um, so for a particular variant, say M orange, I, this, I represent a, a dot on the top of the bar as its excitation maximum and a dot on the bottom as its emission maximum. Okay, so to sort of summarize uh, where things um, stand now, um, we, I've, I've told you about engineering variants based on the Aquaria jellyfish, and so we, the, the blue, cyan, green, and, and yellow, or citrine is a, a version of the yellow fluorescent protein. Or, these were all derived from Aquaria jellyfish. All of these variants here, these, these red and yellowish variants, these were all derived from uh, the discosoma red fluorescent protein. So when you look at this, this selection of colors, um, you can see there's not much room left for new colors. We have an awful lot of colors. Um, so really, what's left to be done? Well, the, I guess uh, a point that uh, really, an, an important point that has to be made is, you know, not, no one of these colors is perfect. And so, once again, this comes down to, you know, what makes a protein better, what makes it worse? Well, I've listed here some things that we might con consider as being uh, good features of fluorescent proteins. So, um, so, for example, a monomeric structure, as I've explained at length now, uh, that's good. That's a, that makes a protein better. And all of the ver ver versions shown here are indeed monomers. Um, fast chromophore maturation. Uh, that's something where some, some of these proteins are better than others. So there are versions of YFP that mature very, very quickly, whereas um, some of these, these red fluorescent proteins actually mature quite slowly. Uh, bright fluorescence. Once again, this is, of course, this is the most obvious thing that you might compare these fluorescent proteins by. Um, and some variants are extremely bright. Once again, YFP is, is very, very bright, uh, whereas other variants are not so bright. So when I... Uh, I, I'm not going to go through the rest of these, but suffice to say that there's many features uh, that make a protein better, and each of these fluorescent proteins has some pros and some cons. Now, when I came to the University of Alberta in 2003 to start my own group, I wanted to continue uh, making improved fluorescent proteins, and so I really took a step back and looked at this, this range of, of colors that was available and said to myself, you know, which protein is the most important one to improve. And eventually I decided that ECFP was a protein that really needed uh, improvement. The, the reason I, I picked ECFP is because it, it is a very important color. It's widely used for FRET with, with, with YFP. So FRET stands for Fluorescence Resonance Energy Transfer. So the CFP YFP pair is very important for this purpose. Uh, so it's an important fluorescent protein, yet it has some distinct drawbacks associated with it. Uh, for example, it, it wasn't particularly bright, uh, 
And it also has this very, very broad excitation and, and emission peak uh, that also are less suitable for, for, for use in imaging applications. So how are we actually going to go about improving it? Well, so once again, I thought, let's look to the ocean. And let's start with one of these, these newer proteins that have been discovered in coral. So you recall that there was all these different colors had, had been reported in coral, including cyan fluorescent proteins. Now, I guess there's really two big important differences between this cyan fluorescent protein and the, what was known as e, and, and the protein known as ECFP. One is, of course, that this is a tetramer, whereas ECFP is a monomer. So that's something sort of a negative against the coral protein. Uh, but on the other hand, this coral protein has a tyrosine-derived chromophore as opposed to a tryptophan-derived chromophore. And I really suspected at the time that the, the undesirable properties of ECFP were due to the fact that it had a tryptophan-derived chromophore and if only we could make a version with a tyrosine-derived chromophore that had similar spectral properties, uh, it, would, it would be superior to ECFP. So we started with a, a, a protein from a, a coral known as Clavularia, uh, clavula and specifically Clavularia CFP. So I didn't actually go jump in the ocean and get a sample of the coral and clone it. Uh, we took a slightly different ap approach, and, and our approach was to have the, the gene encoding the Clavularia uh, CFP chemically synthesized for us. And so we commissioned this gene synthesis. And actually, we didn't ask for a single gene. We Instead of designing a single gene, we designed a gene library. So because of my background in, in engineering the RFP, as well as by looking at uh, sequence alignments with the, the small number of uh, natural CFPs that were available, I picked a, a number of positions within the, the, the gene that I thought would be important, and I, I introduced degeneracy, which means more than one possible amino acid at these positions, at these, at actually at 14 positions, in the hopes that some of these mutations would indeed be beneficial to the gene, and we would pick those out when we screened the, this, li this synthetic library. So, se so semi-degenerate or partially randomized positions were, uh, residues were inserted at 14 different positions within the gene, and this made a, a library of about uh, a million variants or so. So you can see I've colored uh, different positions, either green or red. Uh, the green, the positions in green are actually residues pointed into the dimer interface, so these were mutations I was introducing in the hopes that they would uh, break apart the, the tetramer into a dimer, just as the isoleucine 125 arginine mutation did with discosoma RFP. And then at other positions, marked in red, at the majority of positions, these are positions actually pointing inside the, the protein, so uh, packed inside of the, the, the beta can. And these are mutations that I thought would be helpful or possible mutations that would be helpful to the, the brightness of the fluorescence, or even rescue the, 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 the fluorescence of a dimer, which might be crippled relative to the tetramer. Okay, so starting from our synthetic gene library, we, we took that initial library and screened it, and eventually found a very bright dimer, which we, we designated version 0 0.1, and it actually had at, at, four, at those 14 designed positions, it had mutations at eight of them. Uh, so that was sort of a, a validation for, for the approach. It, the, the, many of those mutations had indeed been important to the, the brightness of, of our, the dimer that we picked out of that initial library. So starting on a, uh, this process of extensive directed evolution, so many, many rounds of direct evolution, we, we, we first improved the dimer, then we introduced mutations that broke the dimer to a monomer, and then we started uh, further screening. And by the time we got to 0 0.7, we were uh, quite pleased with the protein that we had made. And by that, I mean it was very bright. And it was certainly a, a novel color. So it had retained the color of its, of its wild type uh, ancestor. And so we took that gene and we did the normal thing. We fused it to actin, expressed it in, in a mammalian cell. And we were pleased to see that there was fluorescence. But what we weren't pleased to see is that fluorescence just rapidly disappeared. So as soon as we took a single image, a single micros uh, image using a fluorescence microscope, the fluorescence was gone. Uh, 
and that was very disappointing. That meant that this protein was particularly uh, photolabile, or it had very bad photostability, uh, another way of saying the same thing. So we had made a, a very photo-unstable protein. Then again, um, for the, the photostability was not something we'd ever selected for. We were only selecting for brightness. So we really had, hadn't had any control over photostability. So what we did is we continued doing directed evolution, but now we were uh, selecting for photostability. And so in each round, we would pick the version that was the best compromise of brightness and photostability. So doing several more rounds like that, we eventually ar arrived at version 1.0, so MTFP1. We actually call this protein um, teal fluorescent protein because the, the, the color is a little bit uh, red shifted from the cyan fluorescent protein, but it's still quite blue shifted relative to uh, the green fluorescent protein. So the color that I think lies between cyan and green is best described as teal. So anyway, this protein is known as a teal fluorescent protein. And shown on this graph here is a comparison of the photostability of, of MTFP1, MTFP.7, and a couple other variants. So basically what we're doing here is we're looking at the fluorescence uh, versus time for solutions of these, of these proteins under micro under illumination on a fluorescence microscope. And so MTFP.7, that's the one that bleaches very quickly. So here we start at full fluorescence, we turn on the light, and the fluorescence just drops right down to zero in a matter of uh, hundreds of milliseconds. So that's not useful. In comparison, our photostable versions, such as MTF, our photostable M MTFP1, uh, the fluorescence di still diminishes because all fluorescent proteins are photobleach at some rate. Um, but this rate of photobleach is actually relatively slow, so MTFP1 is pretty good in terms of photostability, and it's uh, a little bit better than either other, other cyan variants no, such as uh, cerulean or uh, ECFP. Here we show the uh, emission spectrum. So I'd, I'd mentioned a little bit earlier that one, one of the drawbacks of, of ECFP or cyan fluorescent protein uh, that was derived from jellyfish was the fact that it had this tryptophan derived chromophore and I believe that this tryptophan derived chromophore uh, is the reason why it has a very broad uh, emission peak. So cerulean is, is, a, is a recent and improved version of, of, of the Aquaria cyan fluorescent protein and shown in cyan is its emission peak. So you'll see that it's very, very broad and for the sake of comparison, here's the emission peak of GFP and the emission peak of YFP. So the cerulean peak is much broader than these peaks. Um, and it's also got this strange uh, double humped structure. In contrast, uh, here we have the emission peak of MTFP1, which remember the big difference between, uh, for example, cerulean and MTFP1 is that MTFP1 has a tyrosine drive chromophore. This has a tryptophan drive chromophore. GFP and YFP also both tyrosine drive chromophores. And so that's why these three proteins all have similar peak shapes and the peak shape of cerulean is distinctly different. So th this is an advantage of, of MTFP relative to cerulean. A collaborator of mine, Michael Davidson, has made a large number of targeting constructs using MTFP1. So this series of con constructs targets the MTFP1 protein to a large number of different structures and compartments inside of the cell. And you can see just by the, the range of images here, uh, there, there is a wide diversity of targeting constructs that are available. And once again, this really illustrates the, the power of fluorescent proteins to, to, to label different things within the cell. One satisfying result that's come out of this is that the MTFP1 fusions appear to behave analogously to GFP fusions and that's really a, a good benchmark that the fluorescent protein is behaving as we think it should, as a, as a true monomer. Another interesting thing that we've done with MTFP is solve the crystal structure. This is actually work done in the lab of Jim Remington at the University of Oregon. Uh, Professor Remington had previously solved the crystal structure of a cyan fluorescent protein that was tetrameric, so it's like a wild type coral cyan fluorescent protein. And now together uh, with our lab, he's, he'd solved the 
the structure of our monomer, MTFP1, which was of course derived from a tetrameric protein. Now, it's, I, I put this up here, one, because I think it's a very pretty picture, but it also illustrates uh, the difference between the tetramer and the monomer uh, very clearly. So here we see one monomer involved in the, the tetramer. So these protein-protein interfaces here are biologically rele relevant protein-protein interfaces. In contrast, the protein-protein interfaces here are not biologically relevant. These are crystal packing interactions that are necessary for the, the, for the protein to crystallize, but by, by looking closely at them we can tell that they are, are not biologically relevant inter interactions. So that's a, a very interesting result and gives a nice visual confirmation of the monomeric structure which we already knew that this protein had. In summary, uh, I guess the, the the most important point uh, I'm trying to get across today is that there is a, a wide range of colors of monomeric fluorescent proteins now available for use in research. However, no one fluorescent protein is, is perfect but for all applications and protein engineers such as myself are still working to improve the properties of, of the series of fluorescent proteins. The, the where this matters, why this is an important point to get across, is because if you are planning to do an experiment with a fluorescent protein, depending on the, the your experimental conditions and what you hope to achieve, you, you, you would be well advised to spend some time making sure you get the right protein for your application. I really believe that future work in this area will, will, will likely focus on engineering new variants with improved properties, but in addition, I, I can see some new directions emerging in the, in the area of fluorescent protein engineering. One is to make variants with novel spectroscopic properties. For example, photo switching variants are, are a very exciting new area. And these are fluorescent protein variants where the fluorescence can actually be turned on or off with light, or even switch from one color to another color using light. Uh, the other really exciting new direction is in the development of variants with biosensing properties. So this is where the, the fluorescence of the fluorescent protein depends upon some other uh, biochemical event, such as the, the activity of an enzyme, such as a kinase, or it depends on the concentration of a small molecule uh, inside the living cell. So, so these are really exciting uh, new directions in the area of fluorescent protein engineering. I'd just like to acknowledge uh, some of the people that, that made this work possible. All of the work with regards to red fluorescent proteins and the development of the M-Fruit ser series was done in the lab of Professor Roger Chen. In my own lab at the University of Alberta, all of the work on engineering of teal fluorescent proteins was done by Hui Wang, uh, my, my, my first PhD student. The crystal structure of MTFP1 was done by Professor Remington at the University of Oregon uh, by his student, uh, Nathan Henderson. All of those fusion constructs were made by Michael Davidson. Financial support for the work at the University of Alberta was provided by the Canada Research Chair Program, the University of Alberta, the Canadian Foundation for Innovation, NSERC, and an Alberta Ingenuity New Faculty Award. Finally, I'd like to thank you very much for your time, and I encourage you that if you, if you have any questions about uh, things I've said today, um, anything you want clarification on, please don't hesitate to send me an email. You can contact me through my, my, my webpage, and the address of that page is given on the last slide of this talk following the three slides of references. So once again, thank you very much, and goodbye.